Good morning, everybody. My name is Armando Berdiel, Technical Development Supervisor with Lighting Design Lab. Today, we bring the cost-effective code compliance series. It is our second delivery of this year. And today, we're going to be discussing the building envelope. And very lucky for me, we have a group of subject matter experts that are going to be sharing their knowledge on how to approach this 20, 2018 code updates when it comes to building envelope. Next slide, please. Let's see if how that works. And we're going to make the next slide happen. Here we go. <laughs> Awesome. But before we begin, uh, you'll notice that you are going to be muted. Uh, please engage with us by using the chat feature on the on the GoToWebinar uh, dashboard. Uh, any questions you want or comments, you can type them in the chat and we'll be able to see them here on our end. Uh, we will also uh, ask the presenters to pause if there's questions that would benefit the larger group to be answered live. Uh, at the very end of the presentation we're going to have a couple of polls and we want you to please engage with us uh, the more you put into this the more we can all get out of it so so please engage uh, after the webinar we are going to have a very like a 30 second survey on how your experience was we please ask you to answer it uh, also please note a recording of of the webinar is going to be available on our youtube channel as well as our web page and and our pdf handout of the slides will be available on our web page as well any questions, comments, uh, please write to us at lightingdesignlab at seattle.gov. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a quick, we wanted to share that, hey, Lighting Design Lab, as well as the Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections and the Division of Customer Care and Energy Solutions are bringing you this webinar, all powered by, we are all a part of Seattle City Light in the greater city of Seattle. Uh, and at the end of this presentation, at the very latter part, you'll have a chance to engage with one of our program implementers for our incentive programs, Julie Banerjee. Uh, so hey, stay tuned and engage with us. Now I am going to tee it up for our speakers. Next slide. Hello. Come on. Yeah. Okay, well, welcome and good morning, everybody. Um, the energy code is just one of those construction codes that everybody has to comply with. That's actually the shelf outside of my office back when I had an office. Um, we call it the 2018 code because it's based on the 2018 IECC, which came out just before, can you guess, 2018. And then in 2019, we worked out the state code changes that go into effect next week. And uh, in 2020, we developed the Seattle code changes that go into effect next month. Um, or I presume they will, city council will decide, I think, tomorrow. We've got state and city legislation in place that's commanding us to make significant progress each code cycle. So unlike most of the states in the country, which where they're still arguing about whether to move forward or not move forward, what we're arguing about is what's the smartest and most economic way to get there. So, these are the four basic principles we use to develop Seattle's amendments. And of course, today we're talking about this first principle. The envelopes we build in the 2020s will still be unchanged in the 2050s when the whole city is supposed to be operating at carbon neutral. And in fact, they're not likely to change for the rest of the century, right? We still have high rises downtown from the 50s and 60s with their original facades. So between this code cycle and next, we have to get our envelopes to that 2050 standard, whatever that turns out to be. So I can tell you from experience that if you really want to kill a dinner party, just start talking about insulation and air barriers and stuff. Uh, civilians never find this to be interesting, and it doesn't help that it's all completely invisible in the finished building. But a good envelope just keeps saving energy for generations to come, and it doesn't have controls to get out of line or thermostats that break or any of that. It's just really solid long-term reliable savings so chapter four is where all the action is in this code but you should really look at chapter three you know once a year or something like that um th that chapter also has some default u values for fenestration uh but the values are bizarrely conservative so never ever use them unless maybe you're recycling some old windows from another building or something uh, I put my little curtain wall sketch in here to highlight a big lie that we've all been accepting all these years. It's 
that same aluminum tube you see on the warm inside of the glazing that runs down uh, to extend to the cold outside in the transom area. So making this thermal superhighway that carries heat from inside the building to outside all winter long. So real soon, we've got to account for that in our calculations. It's going to make curtain wall and window wall look really bad, but um, maybe it's time for those industries to step up. Um, chapter two, by the way, has all the definitions, which are usually, but not always, italicized in the code text. And the meaning is not always what you think it is, because otherwise we wouldn't have had to define it specially, right? So like, for instance, steel frame walls, single ramp to roof, roof recover, opaque door, mass transfer deck. Uh, these are things that are that are specifically defined uh, back in chapter two, and uh, knowing that definition can keep you out of trouble. Um, talking about mass transfer decks, uh, I reworded the definition to be clearer. I thought that the state language was a little opaque. Um, and and uh, clarified that cantilever balconies are not mass transfer decks. These are the things that like when you've got a building that's got a, a, a garage podium that comes all the way to the property line and then a tower that runs up on top of that, that's that deck that carries that structural load from the tower out to the edge. So in uh, the U-value table, Seattle has given these balconies, uh, concrete balconies, a defined value of 0 0.10, which is actually more generous than it is now when they have to be averaged into the overall wall U value. But this is essentially the value of one of those insulated cantilevered slab assemblies you can buy. Um, we also allowed a pretty generous U value for the concrete columns that extend down into the garage, whereas it used to be just sort of not mentioned in the code. And uh, will now allow the slab area directly on top of a city light vault to be uninsulated completely. These are examples of the kinds of things that come from the stakeholders during those many hours of meetings we had, who've had to hassle with this kind of stuff or, or argue with my building department um, in, in uh, real world projects. So Jason, uh, tell them how this works. Sure. Uh, thanks, Joanne. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, just to, to add um, about thermal insulation being boring, uh, we find it fascinating. This is what we talk about during our dinner parties. So, uh, you know, that's that's why I guess I, why I'm here today. So I'm going to start off by uh, talking about the um, changes to wood frame wall requirements. Um, these changes apply both in the state um, code and in Seattle's code. So previous code cycles, uh, two by six construction, uh, conventional framing at 16 on center uh, with R21 bat insulation. That was all that was required to meet uh, the prescriptive code targets and also uh, R value targets and also U factors. Uh, now in the 2018 code, uh, within uh, the state code, this only applies in group R occupancies or in other occupancies, the old requirements are, are, are still adequate. And in the SEC, it's uh, all occupancies, these new insulation targets apply. Um, we've got to do a bit better. So um, these are the R value tables uh, from the WSEC, and they've listed a few options in the bottom right cell on the screen for achieving these uh, insulation targets. So we could do two by four wall with R13 VAT plus R7.5 continuous insulation, two by six wall uh, with R4 continuous insulation, or R25 insulation, which most often requires two by eight construction, so a thicker wall. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here we're looking at the U factor changes rather than the R value. So the U factor requirements are reduced from 0.054 to 0.051. And um, we've done some calculations to look at various uh, configurations that meet this requirement. Uh, these are listed here. So one way to go about this is changing framing practices. So uh, for the past century, uh, walls have been framed at 16 on center. Um, understandably, there's a lot of resistance to uh, increasing the spacing to 24 inches on center and meeting the advanced framing criteria listed in the code. Um, you know, so uh, in the past, when we've broached this subject, we've seen a ton of resistance from contractors and have gotten nowhere. We, we may, I think we're going to see more interest in this because of the cost savings that are inherent with sticking with two by six framing. Uh, so not only do you need a structural engineer's buy-off to pursue this, but, uh, you know, have a conversation with your contractor earlier. See if it's an option that can that can actually be on the table. Um, 
And you know, just one other thing to consider with two by six framing is your, your cladding selection. A lot of cladding systems are designed uh, to be attached at 16 on center. Uh, it's nothing that's insurmountable. Uh, it just might take some extra thought to making sure you're, you're, you're thinking through those cladding attachments, especially if you're, uh, your sheathing is not a nailable plywood sheathing, if you've got gyp sheathing, uh, something along those lines. Uh, so other options, two by eight framing with R25 bat, uh, that, that can get us to uh, the, these uh, new requirements. Uh, a, a method that we like a lot at RDH that we've been doing a long time is continuous exterior mineral wool insulation. Uh, and with wood frame construction in particular, it's pretty easy. Um, you can fasten a pressure treated furring strips directly through that exterior mineral insulation and attach your cladding to those furring strips. So um, yeah, we've been doing that for, uh, for years at RDH and um, it works, it's effective, it's relatively cost effective. So uh, that's definitely an option to, to, to have on the table. Um, and you know, one other, uh, one other way to, uh, to, to achieve this without increasing your, uh, or without changing your framing, two by six framing is a so-called flash and back technique where we have a couple inches of closed cell spray foam sprayed into the cavity and the rest of the cavity is filled with bat insulation. Uh, closed cell spray foam, it's got a high R value per inch, but it's a vapor barrier. So um, it's, this is going to change the way moisture moves through your walls. So, um, you know, take a close look at this. Uh, our climate is, uh, it's really tough on buildings. Um, it's cold and damp for six months straight. There's very little drying potential to the exterior for our walls. So if you're going to prevent walls from drying to the interior, your weather barrier had better be installed perfectly. You need rain screen cladding. So you need an air gap outside of that weather barrier. And even with those, you know, you're, you're increasing risk basically. You've just got much less tolerance for, uh, for any kind of leaks through your weather barrier. So um, you know, our advice there is uh, you know, proceed with caution. Um, you know, it's definitely not our first choice, especially in our, in our local climate. Um, okay, uh, next please, Joy. <laughs> Hey, uh, Jason, very sorry to interrupt. We have a question asking uh, if R23 bat in, in two by six intermediate intermediate framing will work as well. Uh, R23 bat, my understanding is that will, will not work. Um, if you can provide a U-factor calculation that demonstrates that, I think that's something that the code official could be up to. That's not something I came across, uh, you know, in, in reviewing the, uh, the changes to the code that the R23 bat would get there. Thank yeah, you, and 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 do um, if if you got a, a legitimate U value calculation that shows you're you're there, you're golden. 0 0.051. Right in the code uh, specifically in the uh, in Appendix A, it shows framing factors for your various uh, for you know the, the different framing configurations, advanced framing, standard framing, intermediate framing. So base those calculations on that and bring it to the table. But I I don't think that quite gets you there. So this is a really big deal here. Um, I think this building must be huge. It's got, what is that, 27 fans set up there. Um, but um, up until now, you've had to do the air barrier testing, but you didn't have to pass the test. So there's two big changes this year. The target test standard has been reduced from 0 0.40 to 0.25 CFM per square foot of envelope. But the big change is that you have to pass the test at the old value of 0.4. In between 0.25 and 0.4, if you're over to 0.25, there are uh, some things you have to do to go back and try to fix uh, what's fixable. But to get your certificate of occupancy now, you got to pass that 0.4. So you want to do it right from the beginning. This means envelope performance is going from being kind of voluntary to mandatory. Uh, I will say that that we've almost never seen buildings fail uh, the test standard when they've had a professional um, building science firm on the job, <clears throat> but others have. So Danelle is going to show how it's just really easy. Sorry, I uh, muted myself. Um, thanks, Dwayne. So I'm going to summarize you know what really should be like an hour-long presentation into about five minutes so I'm going to give you the the three keys to how to make an airtight building um, and it's real simple uh, you have to design it airtight you have to build it airtight and you have to confirm that it's airtight um, and those are all essential steps you really can't get away with uh, not having one or more of these uh, present and um, I, we've we've certainly seen examples where one or more of these falls short and it, it generally doesn't go well. 
Uh, next slide. So, you know, it, it all starts with the design. Um, I, I think there are quite a few architects on the call. Um, and, you know, I like to say that, uh, you know, good construction cannot overcome bad design, but uh, bad construction can be somewhat overcome by excellent design. So I think we need to expect that it's not going to get built perfectly and we need to account for that in our design. Um, and, and so that, that really all starts with identifying and defining our assemblies, um, our enclosure assemblies, and, and just knowing where that air barrier layer is, um, not just within the assembly, but within the building itself. So where does the actual air barrier need to go in the building? Um, and from that point, we can start to identify some key interfaces uh, where assemblies come together, you know, where, where anything punches through the air barrier, like, you know, windows or doors or balconies or uh, metal decks, anything that, that goes through that air barrier layer. Um, and then, you know, once we kind of get into CDs, uh, you start drawing details and you really have to think in three dimensions. So, you know, we draw details in two dimensions typically, but you got to think about, you know, what happens in and out of the page, what happens uh, when one detail runs into the next detail and how that all gets sealed together. And the, you know, the key word here in design is continuity. Um, yeah, I know there are other aspects to what's important in an air barrier, but the most important thing is that it's continuous. If it's not continuous, it none of the other aspects really matter that much. It's just not going to work. Um, so you you go from you know these concept sketches like we see here on this slide to uh, um, an actual building, and there's there's a lot of critical thinking that has to happen along the way in terms of how these things come together. Um, and then. When you're building it, um, just a, a few things that we've found are, are really critical is obviously pre-installation meetings. You have to get everyone in the same room, all the subs, the general contractor, and actually talk through these things. So talk through who's installing what, and, and more importantly, when they're installing it. Um, sequencing is a big issue. Um, we, we see here in this picture that you know the siders went first and, and installed the air barrier. The roofers came in and, and pulled it up and, and uh, just torched the hell out of it. Um, we, we see stuff like this all the time, you know, where they put the, the cart before the horse and things get screwed up in the field. And, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's important to not just think in, in 3D, but also in 4D, add that, that time dimension in there. Um, <clears throat> and another, another way to work through these issues before we get into a situation like this in the field is to, uh, to do mock-ups. Um, this could be anything from just uh, first in place work to get everyone look at it and, and work through the sequencing or you know full-fledged freestanding mock-up you know uh, some contractors will build a build a tiny house um, with all the or as many details as they can from the building and and put it into a little tiny house for the mock-up um, it's it's really critical um, to get all the trades together in the same place at the same time and actually work through who's installing what and what order they're going to go in. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing that we found actually has a big influence is um, is having a, some some person or people in some cases uh, from the general contractor that are full time QC on the building envelope um, and on the air barrier. Um, some contractors do this, and, and we've generally had much better luck getting really tight air test results uh, on their projects. Um, it, of course, having a you know a third party inspector such as you know such as my firm and 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 others in town um, is really helpful to kind of get that higher level expertise and and planning ahead for uh, you know what what these details might look like. Um, but the reality is that we can't be out there every single day looking at this stuff. There needs to be somebody accountable on the GC side that actually looks at this stuff and knows what they're looking at and takes it seriously. Next slide. Um, and then the, the confirmation process is also really critical. And I think a lot of people think that this just means the, the whole building test at the end of the project, but really the, the confirmation happens all the way through. Um, this is anything from visual review, so you actually have to get out on site and look at it, um, to qualitative testing. So this could just be, um, you know, just 
pulling on a self-adhered membrane, seeing if it's stuck. Um, it could be putting a you know a fog machine up against a soffit and seeing if there's an air leak through the you know through this metal deck here, which we can see that there is. Um, or it could be quantitative testing where you're actually getting you know pull test numbers, you know making sure your adhesion is sufficient, um, making sure your uh, you know you, you could test uh, an entire unit for air leakage or or test just a window or uh, test um, you know whole floor of a of a building. We've done that as well. Um, so some interim air leakage testing. Um, this is all part of the confirmation process. So this is I like to think of the the whole building test is really the the final exam. Um, and this is this is kind of doing all your studying and your homework along the way. So if you do your homework, if you study, um, the final exam really shouldn't be that hard. Um, but if you try to cram last minute, it's really not going to go well. Um, and this is, you know, none of this has changed by the way since the previous codes. Um, we've we've had to do air leakage testing for about a decade now. So this is all the same process that we should have been familiar with already. It's just now becoming more important. There's actually real consequences if you don't take this seriously. So hopefully this isn't uh, groundbreaking information to anybody, but uh, it's it's certainly becoming a lot more critical and and we're really we have there there's a big hammer that that can come down if you don't actually take this seriously and uh, and pass the test. And not to scare everyone too much because we've had, uh, literally hundreds of tests that we've done now um, just at our company. And uh, I think we've had maybe, I think it was 11 or 12 now that haven't hit 0.4. Um, and every single one of those has a story. And I'll, I'll say that none of them were a surprise. Um, it's, uh, it's we've, we've never had a test fail that 0.4 mark and been scratching our heads thinking, gee, I wonder what happened. It's very clearly, we know who screwed up. We know why it failed, um, and it's it's generally been a, a lack of effort or uh, just a, a poor attitude towards this whole process. Um, so I'll I'll leave it at that. Um, happy to chat more about this if there are other questions at the end. And I would I would toss in there in support of Danelli stuff that what we see is that problems each trade can do its own stuff just fine but those intersections where the work of one trade stops and the other one starts or where one trade stuff pokes through somebody else's work that's where trouble just thrives um okay uh you know that the only uh difference between in envelopes anyway between a semi-heated and a fully conditioned space is that you're not required to do insulation in the opaque walls in the state code, there's two exceptions. The first exception is for uh, uh, infrared heating. And in the Seattle code, we clarified this doesn't mean heating the whole space with infrared. It means you know, just uh, spot heating and, and that they have to turn off automatically with occupancy sensors. The second one in the state code, and I can't believe I let this through because I was still in charge of that committee at that time, says that you can call a space semi-heated if it uses a heat pump with the cooling side disabled. I, I figure this means that you whack the reversing valve in your in your uh, heat pump with a sledgehammer or something. But no, for Seattle, we're just saying if the space is heated by whatever kind of equipment, it's a heated space. Um, if you're using the prescriptive path, which means you're not doing any energy modeling, you get 30% glazing area. And my experience is that works fine for everything except high-rise office and high-rise residential. They want lots of glass. You can get 40% if half of your floor plate is in a daylight zone, which would require an extremely skinny floor plate. Or uh, if you use super low U-value glazing, and we'll get to that in a few slides. In case you haven't heard, for modeling, we're switching entirely over to the ASHRAE Appendix G method. Our old modeling thing is going in the trash next month. Um, the new method gives a specific uh, glazing area for each building type. So you can see that an office tower would get 40% uh, as its baseline, while a grocery store would only get 7%. The cool thing here is that you can also get modeling credit for using less glazing than those percentages. Uh, for the building types that are not listed, which includes multifamily, the maximum percentage is 40%, but uh, you use the old 
system where for modeling, you either use the 40% or the actual area of your glazing if it's less than 40%. So in all the previous codes, we've had two different fenestration categories, metal and non-metal, that's gone, sorry. Now we have two different categories again, but one is for site-built fenestration, you know, like curtain wall and storefront and stuff, plus what's called class AW windows, which are uh, typically only used in high rise. And there's another category for all other, which includes most punched openings. So Seattle's U values are a bit lower. These are still available in double glazed units. And also we allowed a little slack for operable window sections uh, at the request of some, uh, some participants in the hearings. Maybe uh, Jason will be able to explain this uh, site built versus all other class thing. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Dwayne. Um, sure, yeah, as Dwayne mentioned, there's a, a change in how windows are categorized in the code. Um, so rather than metal frames, we now have class AW, site built, and curtain wall. So what does that mean? Um, so off to chapter two in the code, the definition of uh, site built fenestrations at the bottom of the page. Um, you know, field glazed or field assembled units. Um, examples include storefront, curtain wall, atrium roof system. So, um, you know, I think largely these are still going to be uh, metal frame glazing systems like, uh, you know, curtain wall, window wall, storefronts. However, since it's no longer based on the material type, um, there's an opportunity for certain glazing types that still meet these requirements to, to get categorized within this group, specifically fiberglass windows. We think this is a, a nice opportunity, nice change for, for those manufacturers. And it makes sense to base it on how the window is installed, in its performance uh, rather than um, you know just what it's made out of. And if you could give me one more click, please, Dwayne. Um, so here on the bottom, I've replaced that uh, definite the, the code definition with what class AW means. So class AW is um, part of the North American Fenestration Standard, NAS. Um, and this is the higher performance, uh, highest performance class of glazing. Um, some of the uh, primary performance characteristics are listed here, uh, design pressure, uh, structural test pressure of uh, 40 and PSF, uh, 40 and 60 PSF respectively, and a minimum water uh, penetration resistance of 8 PSF. So this is typically what's required on, on high rise buildings. Um, however, there may be a, you know, different window systems that meet this, uh, meet this class AW requirement or, or uh, all the, the performance standard here. And these are just some of the um, requirements here, the, the kind of the principal ones. There's other requirements related to operation, um, forced entry resistance, and you could go on for a while. Um, so talk to your manufacturers, maybe they have some uh, products that, that qualify for this that aren't your, uh, your, your, your typical site built uh, products. Um, so there's, I think, some anxiety uh, locally about these reduced U factor requirements and what it's gonna take to get there. Um, the way we see these requirements, these changes, and I, I think this is what uh, the city's intent was, is that we're just weeding out the worst performers. So U.34 for these systems, um, these are readily available products. Um, you know, some of the worst performers, so for example, is storefront. Um, you know, Conair has a 451T and a 451UT, ultra thermal. That ultra thermal system has two thermal breaks. That's a, you know, plain vanilla storefront uh, fenestration system. And, um, you know, there's a lot of other manufacturers that have similar, like, kind of thermally enhanced products. Um, those will meet the U.34 requirement. And uh, same with most unitized uh, structurally glazed curtain wall, um, many stick built curtain wall systems, the thermally improved ones, they're gonna, they're gonna be able to meet this requirement. The, the difference is they're not gonna be able to vastly exceed it. Like in the previous code, your, your, these standard systems were, were far better than those minimum requirements. And that's gonna have some, some implications. Um, so we don't see this as being a huge change or like being a, a huge departure from, from current construction practices. Um, on to the next one, please. So, um, uh, you know, same, uh, similar conversation for um, the other category of windows. So U.26 being required for fixed and U.28 for operable. Um, so what, what does it take to get there? Um, you know, widely available vinyl windows, uh, fiberglass windows meet this as well. Um, these are you know, the standard windows that we, that we install every day. Uh, VPI vinyl windows is a popular manufacturer. They, they can get this with their, uh, with their standard products. You know, all our ITUs, of course, now are having inert gas fill, low E coating, um, 
moving away from aluminum IGU spacers towards thermally improved spacers, but uh, not, not a huge change to meet these, uh, these requirements. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's keep moving. All right then, um, remember a couple slides back, I said you could get 40% glazing area for using, in the prescriptive path for using high performance fenestration. So to get this bonus, Seattle requires 0 0.30 for the site build category and 0.22 for the punched window category. And I believe that even these are available in double glazed units if you do everything exactly right. Uh, are you gonna back me up, Jason? Sort of. Let's go to the next slide and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, so here I've, uh, I've included some examples of uh, what it's going to take to get to this uh, for uh, the, the, the Class AW um, windows. Uh, for the most part, um, unitized curtain wall, uh, stick built curtain wall, window wall it is not going to get to U.30 without some modification. Um, these modification doesn't have to be huge though we're not necessarily going to triple pane glazing although that's a you know something that can definitely be looked at something that, that we welcome uh but we understand there's a big cost involved and uh, you know more on that later um but uh what we're seeing what, what we expect to gain a lot of popularity are um interior surface hard low e coatings that go on the igu so this is a coating uh that you would be able to touch if you were on the inside of a building uh, historically that's been um an uncoated surface so these coatings, they've been around for a long time. Uh, the first generation had a lot of issues, really difficult to clean, um, easy to scratch. Um, and, um, but the manufacturers have improved the coatings and um, they've, uh, they've come a long way. Um, I'm gonna go into this a little bit more in the next slide. Uh, another option, you know, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing innovation. Um, uh, fiberglass window wall, this picture on the right here is uh, from Cascadia Windows. This is their uh, relatively new to market uh, fiberglass window wall system. Uh, their two pane system does, uh, does far better than this requirement. So, um, you know, that, that's an option. Um, you know, window wall, we're typically seeing window wall, the standard window wall that's been installed uh, around U.33, 0.34 for fixed. Um, they're thermally enhanced window wall. So there's a manufacturer, Starline, that's got a newer, uh, a relatively new product. That, uh, that can meet this requirement with uh, with two panes of glass. So um, you know, I think we're just gonna we're gonna see innovation, and um, we're not necessarily moving towards three panes, but we're, we might have to tweak uh, tweak the configurations a, a, a bit. Um, next slide, please. Hey, uh, Jason, we have a, a question, and, and maybe speaking to that innovation on uh, what is the lowest uh, U value available currently for punched commercial windows? Question: uh, Is there an available U.12 available? That's a big question. Um, for for punched windows, you know, you can um, you can get to this um, yes, around U.12 for three panes of glass. So we're we're, we're seeing um, we're, we're seeing you know R R8 equivalent. So U.15, U. Point, you know around there for kind of passive house level windows. You're not going to get there with two panes of glass to that level of performance. Um, so um, you know, here um, I've got some uh, diagrams here of, uh, of an IGU with labeled surfaces. So we talk about a surface four coating with a double pane window system. We're talking about that interior coating. Um, and uh, with triple pane, that would be a, a surface six uh, coating. And uh, with, our, uh, with our punched windows, vinyl windows, we're seeing either the surface four coating being required with double pane or, or moving to three pane to, uh, to meet this requirement. And uh, you know, just one more word on these interior surface coatings. Um, it's a change. Um, you know, one of the things that's often talked about is well, so how these coatings work is they take the interior heat and they reflect it back inside, so it doesn't transmit through the window. So in reflecting that heat back to the interior, the window surface actually becomes colder. It's physically true. So that increases our condensation risk. But you know, I, you know, rather than you know dismissing them out of hand because we're increasing condensation list, let's take a closer look at the projects we're working on. Um, some projects that I've worked on in the past, we have taken a closer look, and this alone in Seattle's climate wasn't enough to derail the use of those coatings for the projects that I've worked on. You know, and if you've got an aluminum glazing system, the weak point, thermally speaking, it's not the center of glass. That's not what we're worried about. We're worried about where the glazing interfaces with that aluminum framing member. That's going to be the coldest part when you do your 2D thermal simulations. So, you know, 
by all means, take a close look, especially if you have a humidified space, like we're not saying to, to ignore this physical phenomena, but it's not enough to, to dismiss these surface floor coatings out of, out of hand. Do, do your due diligence. And also, you know, get a sample. The manufacturers have samples. It's the, ma the major glass manufacturers, Guardian, uh, Pilkington. Uh, th there's several others that have these surface floor coatings. You know, take one, scratch it, try to clean it, make sure you're comfortable with it, send it to the owner, let them know this is a change. Just so um, you know, to establish that level of comfort with uh, with making this sort of a uh, change in, uh, in in technology. Okay, um, on to the next one. Um, so some cost anecdotes. Everyone's super worried about you know what is this going to cost um, if to to make these changes and you know. Uh, it's it's not free to go, for example, from two pane to three pane glazing. We've got a, on a, a high rise apartment retrofit that we're working on, sliding glass door uh, that changed from a, an aluminum sliding glass door system from two pane to three pane um, glass was about a 35% cost increase. So not insignificant. Um, uh, another anecdote from a window wall tower that we're working on, um, going from a, a standard window wall system to a thermally enhanced aluminum window wall system, that was about a 10% cost increase. Uh, maybe 15 percent, ten dollars a square foot. So not not trivial, uh, but uh, you know it's not um, not 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 necessarily a deal breaker either. Um, the surface floor coatings, a manufacturer said, you know, six to seven bucks a square foot for the surface floor coatings uh, added to your glazing costs. So that's probably the most economical of these choices. And um, on the bottom here, I've got a table um, courtesy of uh, Sharon at Walsh Construction. Thanks, Sharon. Um, just some uh, research they've done into cost increases for um, going from two pane to three pane glass. And we're looking at here is these smaller uh, configurations. That's the base cost. So about a you know one third uh, increase to go to from double to triple pane, and then going to the larger configurations. There's a cost increase there just within double pane, and then you know another approximately one third cost increase from going from uh, from two to three pane. So uh, you know something to plan for. Uh, have these conversations early and often just so. Uh, because uh, the worst thing is a uh, big budget surprises late in the game. So, um, you know, it's uh, important conversations to have uh, early on in this one. Okay, uh, all done there. Next one, please. Uh, Jason, um, it, this is cost of materials only? Um, I, this is installed cost is, is my understanding. Um, yeah, okay. there's, um, you know, uh, I think that with the uh, the larger unitized systems, there there may be um, there may be some increased installation costs and maybe even larger punched openings if there's additional manpower required to get these installed. I think that the the lion's share of those extra costs are going to be uh, going to be in materials uh, with with you know marginal added cost for for install. Thanks. Um, yeah, so um, takeaways, I think I kind of walk through, you know, what, what's available out there and how we're going to get there. Um, the big takeaway for me, I do a lot of code compliance calculations. Uh, you know, it's my job. And in previous code cycles, we made up for underperforming assemblies and for thermal bridges with windows that outperform code. Time and time again, this was the formula. And now we're going to be uh, in a situation where it's going to be a significant, there's going to be added costs for getting windows in Seattle that are better than code. So how are we going to make up for those thermal bridges now? Um, are we going to still pay for more expensive windows? It's going to, I think it's going to be less, a lot less attractive. We're going to, I think the, the, the first, the starting point for these is actually addressing the thermal bridges. So, um, you know, I'm going to go into some of these thermal bridges in the next slide, some of the common ones, and, the, and the, these will be a reoccurring theme throughout the, the rest of the presentation. Um, to the next one, please. Um, so here, um, you know, I, I, here are some examples of mass transfer slabs that are, are, are difficult to avoid. So on the top right there, these are uh, two um, wood frame apartment buildings on a um, common concrete podium, a common concrete PT slab. So where that slab extends from conditioned space to the exterior, we have a, a mass transfer slab, extremely difficult to insulate. So um, code only requires you know, R5 at mass transfer slabs, but this uninsulated slab is closer to R1.5. So if you have a significant amount of area, we've got to figure out a way to make up for that elsewhere. So in the bottom left, where we often see this occurring as well, is where we've got parking adjacent to conditioned space. We've got a mass transfer slab. So we just got to start to think about you know, where, where if, if we've got designs that incorporate these elements, how are we going to make up for that, that lost ground uh, somewhere else in the building? Um, one more click, please. Um, 
So here, um, you know, I, I talked about window wall a bit earlier. One of the main challenges with window wall is slab bypasses. They aren't, they don't have great thermal insulation at the slab. So this image here is a concrete slab. We've got a blue uh, waterproofing membrane over the slab edge, and then we're seeing our window wall slab bypass panel over the top of that. So that brown element there that's our mineral insulation at slabs we typically with most window wall systems get an inch and a half to two and a half inches of mineral wool best case so you know you're looking at r5 to r9 maybe r10 typically at a uh, window wall slab bypasses so uh, in the washington state code um, r10 is required at mass walls so we're getting pretty close to what we need to do to meet that r10 requirement within the city that's r17 so um you know with window wall systems We've, um, we're just not quite meeting code um, at the slab bypasses. So it's, uh, it's something for window wall manufacturers to try to address um, through improvements in design. And it's also just something to keep in mind if we're thinking about um, using a window wall system on projects, that those uh, slab bypasses are a, uh, they're a weak point. And, you know, there's other you know, common thermal bridges. We're gonna get into PTACs and concrete balconies later in the, in the presentation. Concrete curves at the base of wall, we love those for waterproofing they can be difficult to insulate. So just thinking through these thermal bridges and um, identifying them and trying to insulate them properly is, uh, you know, that's uh, it, it, it's something that needs to start early in design. All right, let's 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 keep moving on. Joanne, on to your slide. Okay. Um, everybody who's been to architecture school has had this picture on a history test. Uh, it was first published 99 years ago. So it's been four generations of architecture professors now, and we still haven't broken out of this weird fascination with the all-glass tower, have we? Do you think the fad will blow over sometime? Um, I don't think Mies thought it would. Uh, anyway, thanks to a late game compromise in the in the code uh, um, making arena, you can have 35% glazing area instead of 30% with this prescriptive path, okay? Um, like I said earlier though, the only buildings asking for more than 30% are high rises, and they're most likely to use energy modeling anyway. Uh, we'll see. Uh, okay, so you need an NFRC sticker on any kind of manufactured window, and you leave it on until the inspectors come through and see the, the stickers there. We used to require that you submit the, the NFRC's CPD number for every window, but now we only require those if the windows you're submitting are better than code and you're using that for some kind of a, a trade-off. When it comes to curtain wall and window wall and ribbon wall and storefront glazing, you can supply what's called a CMA bid report with your plan, uh, with your you know um, permit application, which is really easy to get. But you absolutely must get your NFRC label certificate to the inspector before you start installing this stuff on the building. Uh, and the manufacturers are not used to this and they um, they always wanna have it come out like months after the building is done. Uh, of course, the values that show on the label certificate have to be as good as the ones you promised with the CMA report, right? Um, Jason. Oh, okay, just a, a few more words on NFRC labeling. Um, so what does it take? Uh, you know, uh, essentially what it is, is you have to have a thermal simulation done by an accredited third party. And uh, that simulation has to be verified through physical testing. So a hot box test of the Windows system. It takes a while. It's not something that happens overnight. So when a uh, window manufacturer comes to town that's not used to our requirements to actually require an NFRC label certificate, we have to let them know over and over again that this is gonna be required. Um, and uh, they need to get the ball rolling to get this uh, this certification process complete. So, um, you know, uh, it's a conversation that we have early and often. Uh, this was a lot more difficult conversation a few years ago. Um, I think a lot more folks are getting on board with it now. Everyone's just kind of used to what it takes. No one wants to hold up a permit submittal because we don't have the proper documentation. Um, but, um, you know, just because something's listed in your spec so that NFRC label certificate is required doesn't mean the folks bidding on it are going to take that seriously. So let them know. I always refer people to the uh, tip sheet 403 uh, that's shown in the bottom right corner there that's on, available on the web from the city. It uh, spells out the requirements clearly. It says that you can't use manufacturer simulation reports. They've got to be third party. Um, it's that documentation that helps designers um, 
convince contractors that uh, this is what we have to do. Um, and just another word on CMA bid reports, those are not label certificates. The CMA reports, it's a component modeling approach. Um, there's components of these various glazing systems that are pre-certified and um, put into a database, and then the manufacturers can pull from that data database, construct their window system, whatever IGU they're selecting, uh, the various mullions, et cetera, and uh, they can print this report pretty quickly. It's accepted, as Dwayne, as Dwayne mentioned, at the time of permit, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, you, you, you still need a, a label certificate. And I might add that, that it would be smartest, actually, to get the label certificate before they start fabrication. Because the worst thing would be that you've got a little parade of trucks there on the street with uh, your curtain wall system on it, and and uh, it turns out that they missed the U value or something, and there's some big negotiation that has to happen. So um, they're used to doing this late, but it ought to be something you do early. It's a good uh, point. It's nerve wracking. <laughs> We're waiting for those file certificates to come through. Yeah. Um, Okay, so you need a vestibule at any entrance where the public or the staff typically comes and goes from the building, unless the door serves just a space smaller than 3,000 square feet. So your typical Starbucks or something. Also, uh, an emergency exit door at the bottom of the stair. They don't need a vestibule. Seattle clarified that you don't need a vestibule to get to the outdoor dining area from the restaurant. But, um, uh, oh, and there's an exception for the air curtains. Uh, you could use instead. Uh, some people like them, some don't. I, I put this picture in there because, okay, this is what most architects are doing with, you know, it's just like really boring. It seems like this great opportunity for some cool design that gets missed on a regular basis. Anyway, though, uh, at this point, let me introduce a special guest, Mr. Graham Wright, uh, who's going to show us how Passive House treats this whole envelope thing. I wanted to say that I've given Passive House nothing but flack for several years now, but our two standards are getting close enough to each other that we might want to take another look at just how wide that remaining gap is. So, Graham. Uh, thanks, Dwayne. Uh, hi, I'm Graham Wright, Senior Scientist at Passive House Institute US. Um, and uh, as, a, as a movement, you know, the, the idea of Passive House originally was like why am i paying for heat basically uh you know we, we should we should just be able to mostly get rid of that uh uh next slide what's this oh it's dynamic okay yeah so uh it, it, so i would like to so what this does is it kind of emphasizes the loading order uh that you should look at look to your uh passive measures first and then your equipment efficiency and then your your on-site renewables if, if you've got resource and then your off-site renewables um, and uh, you know in in applying those passive strategies we want to make sure we don't screw anything up uh, in terms of of quality health or durability um, next slide okay so yeah, in, in terms of like the, the kit of measures that, that constitutes Passive House, uh, you know, the, the way I like to tell the story is in the 70s, people said, gosh, we've got to insulate. Uh, but then it turned out that like the insulation didn't work very well if, if air was like blowing through it or past it. So then they said, well, we must, uh, we must air seal. And then they they noticed well it's getting pretty stuffy in here so uh, we we should uh, we should ventilate and and while we're ventilating we should balance the ventilation so that it doesn't it doesn't you know uh, tend to force air through the assemblies and while we're doing balanced ventilation we might as well uh, throw some heat recovery on it uh, and then we want to to also uh, make sure that our windows are are doing a good balance of, of limiting the heat losses and and getting some passive solar gains uh, so uh, this slide breaks it down into yeah you got to pay attention to your thermal control your radiation control and your air control uh, and and continuous insulation includes things like not using you know continuous metal girts in your cladding uh, so uh, at at fias at uh, we have taken some care in recent years that our performance standards are 
informed by life cycle cost optimization. Uh, we've used BOPT for that, and, and you know what that's minimizing is the is the uh, basically the sum of your of your energy bills and the annualized cost of the energy saving upgrades. Uh, and uh, uh, what that uh, typically shows is that the biggest opportunity for savings is in space heating. Uh, go ahead. Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> right. So the the game and optimization uh, is is the constraints. Uh, a, a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with that. And so, you know, while our our performance targets are in, informed by life uh, by by cost minimization, we are, you know, forcing. Uh, the windows a bit to make sure that the U value is low enough that uh, you don't get into you know uh, angle draft discomfort, um, and uh, also uh, uh, you know we are we are requiring a very good air tightness uh, as well. So that's sort of that's sort of a bias that we put in into the into the start of our of our performance setting calculations. I think of air tightness as passive house as religion. There is some science to it, but yeah, we it's it's uh, yeah we, we did we did take a look at at it scientifically a bit, but we you know we stayed pretty conservative in so doing. Um, uh, so uh, you know. Uh, Dwayne asked me back in August, I think, for for a comparison for single-family houses. Like, what does uh, what does Washington 2018 uh, code or uh, look like compared to Fias at this point? Um, and uh, so we we looked at that for a a single-family house um, in Seattle and in Spokane. And uh, what you can see there is that is that uh, you know, it's it's maybe not that far off as as Dwayne mentioned, but there's as far as uh, we're concerned, yeah, there's still a bit more uh, juice to be squeezed out of the uh, the space heating, which is the the red bars there. So the yeah, the code cases are on the on the left, uh, and uh, the BS cases are on the right, and the, yeah, the the two sets are just like two, uh, two different uh, foundation types. Go ahead. All right. So uh, we, knowing that this was for this webinar was for commercial, we hastily whipped up a comparison uh, between IECC 2018 and our our new FIAS 2021 standard, and this is for the Department of Energy. Uh, commercial prototype building the multifamily high rise, and uh, so this one is. Uh, so I'll show uh, Seattle and Spokane. So uh, what what's going on here is that uh, you can see that you know we're kind of we're kind of coming to agreement for this building type on the on kind of the U values the 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 thermal transmit transmission. We would push the uh, uh, we would push the windows a little harder, um, and we would we would still push the uh, the air tightness quite a bit tighter. Uh, and uh, I, I don't I don't remember Dwayne if you mentioned whether whether any uh, ventilation heat recovery is required in Seattle. Uh, uh, it looked to us that it wasn't, uh, but yeah, to to meet our targets uh, that you would have to do a bit of that. Um, and uh, so yeah, uh, uh, heat recovery ventilation is required for most situations now. Okay. And and for for heating, uh, in most situations, it's going to be heat pump. Got it. Right. Uh, okay. And uh, let's take a look next at. Okay. <laughs> So uh, for this particular building type, yeah. So uh, passive house is pretty good at at getting rid of of the space heating. Uh, you know, we we 
you know, cut that more than in half. But, you know, it's, it's not a, for that building typology, it's not a big piece of the overall energy pie. Uh, most of it is, is uh, in, in appliances and, and lighting, miscellaneous, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, so you can see there is a, a little bit of a take back in, in terms of uh, slightly increasing the, the uh, ventilation fan energy and, and uh, perhaps increasing the cooling a bit. Uh, but the, on, a, on a site energy basis, the, uh, the, the cooling energy still isn't that high because heat pumps are really good at cooling. Uh, okay, next we can look at the, at the Spokane example. So for Spokane, yeah, we would we would push the R values a little bit harder uh, than than code does, and and we would crank up the ventilation recovery efficiency uh, a bit. Uh, next, go ahead, Dwayne. Are you there? Um, yep. Can you I see her? Can you see the high-rise residential comparison slide? Yes. Thanks. Yeah. So we get a little bit more savings out of the out of the Spokane case there. Very good. Okay. And moving on. So uh, I guess you could you could page forward a, a couple. It looks like there's some more of this dynamic stuff going on. Um, there we go. Uh, yeah, so in Pennsylvania, uh, uh, a, a bunch of, so they, they passed a bunch of incentives for, for uh, passive house certification. And uh, it, uh, so, the, so they actually had enough projects that they could do some statistics on this. Um, and uh, while, the, while the cost per square foot of the projects uh, varied quite a bit uh like passive house versus not passive house like wasn't a factor <laughs> in the in the cost on average um so this this i thought was was pretty uh this we thought was pretty encouraging um and uh uh you know duane duane asked me a question about this like like how is that possible and and i i did have to admit that okay you know, on a on a project on an individual project basis, um, yeah, there's more likely to be a a a cost premium for uh, for passive house, uh, but um, uh, you know, it, it's it's been pointed out by a couple of people, in, including uh, say Mike Stefan at Walsh Construction, that uh, 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 you know, kind of the trick there is is the, the main trick seems to be like the idea of just like make the house like 10% smaller and you could pay for like all the upgrades, all the energy saving upgrades you could want. Um, and, and uh, you know, uh, I'm, I remember Mark Rosenbaum out East saying this for about single family houses for a long time. Uh, but uh, Mike Stefan kind of looked at that for for these uh, multifamily ones, and found basically that if he if he made the units a little bit narrower, so they've got less exterior wall and more shared wall, that that he could kind of pull the same sort of trick. Uh, and uh, uh, so, yeah, uh, that's that's sort of my nutshell story on 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 the passive house cost premium. Uh, I, I think that's about all I've got to say. Okay, well, thank you, Graham. Um, uh, we'll launch back into the rest of our regularly scheduled broadcast here. Um, thermal bridging, uh, this is means a solid metal or concrete thing that transfers heat right through your insulation. And, and these thermal bridges can wipe out half or more than half your wall's insulating value really easily. So, uh, We've made a couple of rules in the in the Seattle code to deal with the most significant thermal bridges, uh, uh, concrete balconies and and window frames. So okay, it's not passive house, um, not quite to Graham's level, but it's a start. So with concrete balconies, you have to either put in an R10 thermal break, uh, 
which is one of those commercially available uh, uh, thermal brake products, uh, structural thermal brake products for balconies, or else uh, use the appendix table value for an uninsulated slab edge, which is a huge 0 0.74. That's like 15 times the allowable heat loss for a wall. So can you make a, a balcony work, Jason? We've tried. Um, yes, we, we, we can figure it out. So um, before we get into that, just a little bit of kind of like, you know, why are we being asked to do this? You know, this seems like a lot of work to have thermally broken balconies. We love our concrete balconies. They're easy and cheap to build. So what we have here is a thermal model uh, that, that we created um, in, in 3D heat transfer software um, with um, some continuous exterior insulation and some bad insulation in a steel stud wall. So we've got these effective uh, R values listed here for, for just, the, uh, just the wall alone excluding a, a balcony uh, below it. So uh, give me another click, please. Um, and so here, now we account for this uh, continuous concrete balcony that penetrates the thermal envelope. So what does that do to the uh, effective R value of the wall plus balcony? Well, it reduces it by about half. So uh, it's meaningful. It's a significant thermal bridge. And this is why um, this is why we're targeting it because it's it, it's a major thermal bridge. It's common in construction, and um, you know um, there there are ways to address it. So um, yeah, I think the next slide will will we'll start to talk about that. Um, okay, so how do we do it? How are we going to do balconies that are actually insulated? So uh, Dwayne mentioned there's one proprietary uh, product um, that is um, that is commercially available. It's a cast-in structural thermal brake with stainless steel rebar that connects the uh, interior structure to the exterior structure. Um, how much do they cost anyways? Um, oh, let's see. Um, I have late breaking information. It's kind of third hand, but um, I'm told uh, 120 to 150 bucks a linear foot installed. So um, not free, um, but um, you know, still, if, it's a, if a concrete balcony is important to you, um, this is one way to achieve it um, with installing these cast-in uh, structural thermal brakes. Um, in the pictures below, I think Denali is going to speak to uh, this example. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is just a pretty typical window wall tower um, here in Seattle. Um, but instead of doing cantilevered concrete balconies, um, they actually just bolted on balconies after the fact. Um, so you can see here in the first picture, they've got uh, these uh, plates uh, welded to embeds at the slab edge. You got your, your standard self-adhered membrane uh, covering that window wall bypass condition on the slab edge, sealed around all the, uh, those plates. Um, then they install the window wall first um, and then come back in and, and crane in the, uh, the balcony that sits on those plates and bolts through those, uh, those holes you see there. Um, so they're able to insulate that slab edge much better than, uh, than it would be with just a, a, the concrete slab punching through there. I mean, you still have thermal bridging through the, through the steel of the plates, but it's, uh, it's quite a bit less than if it was just continuous concrete all the way through that window wall system. So that's an option as well. Um, it does take a pretty decent chunk of uh, crane time toward the end of the project, which is uh, it can be challenging to schedule, but um, it's it's certainly a better option than uh, than concrete uh, as far as the thermal performance goes. Next slide, please. Oh, here it is. Okay, so um. This is just kind of something I like to share because it's a, it's a convoluted RFI from a project we worked on in South Lake Union, um, where we've got an interior slab on the right side of this picture and an exterior concrete balcony on the left side with insulation between the two. Um, that exterior concrete balcony is supported by uh, intermittent angles, kind of like what Denali was showing uh, previously, but there's also an exterior structure that holds that up, not shown in this detail. And, um, you know, we talked about, you know, precast balconies uh, that would be craned in later, but there was nowhere to store those on site, lots of crane time, uh, impacts to construction schedule, so that option was mixed. And what we uh, came up with here was a custom option for um, not only insulating the, uh, the, the, the transition from exterior to interior, but also allowing it so that the, uh, both slabs could be uh, cast at the same time, called a simulcast balcony and interior slab. 
So what we did is we had a, um, a waterproofing membrane that was placed over a stay form at the outside of the structure. That's kind of right, uh, right underneath uh, the window system, right in line with the window system. And um, so there's a waterproofing membrane on that stay form, uh, two inches of XPS insulation, so R10. And uh, you know this worked uh, this worked all right. I think um, in retrospect, um, uh, the, the the waterproofing got a little beat up during construction. And I think if we were to go back, we would uh, watch them a bit more closely for the first pour and make sure they were on the right track in terms of protecting the waterproofing, so we could tie in it later at the window sill above and the window head below to can, can have a continuous waterproofing membrane. So lesson learned, but you know still it just kind of shows like. If we're, if we're willing to think outside the box about how to go about this, we, we can make it happen without you know, derailing construction schedules and, and without, um, without excessive cost. Um, and on the next slide, I've got a, a few more examples. Um, so on this next slide, these are, uh, these are photos I stole from one of our passive house presentations. Um, so these are all passive house buildings. Um, the top right, this is a, a, a affordable housing project in Belgium um, that uses that structural thermal brake system um, um, that for us. So they had a concrete balcony um, and uh, kind of looks like a conventional balcony, you know. Um, the top left here, we have a, a, a bolt on balcony configuration. Um, and uh, I think this does a great job of uh, clearly expressing the fact that that structure is supported so we could have a bolt on attachment. Um, some architects may cringe at that balcony, uh, the, the look of it, but uh, it's effective thermally. So um, you know, if we can figure out ways to, uh, to support those balconies and have bolt-on balconies, that, that works great thermally. And um, on the bottom left, a, a, a project in Germany, passive house project, where we have um, exterior structure to support those balconies. Um, and um, you know, that's a challenge for the architects. I, I think that looks really cool. And um, just figuring out a way, if we're gonna, if we want balconies, you know, with exterior structure, how how can we make it look nice and um, you know, still still deliver a, a, a sharp looking building? It's a, kind of a challenge to everyone. And you know, I mentioned these are all passive house buildings. Um, one thing to note is, you know, smaller punched openings. You know, passive house tends to limit glazing areas. And it, it, if you don't do that, you require a super, super expensive window system to achieve the high R values required for passive house. It's kind of a general observation there. Um, okay, uh, joining on to the next slide. I think, I think another thing that's been stuck in architecture school for the last 99 years is the idea of the pure cantilever being somehow, somehow special. Um, okay, so, uh, with with vertical fenestration, uh, with window frames, this rule is just about lining up the glass with the opaque wall insulation. So making sure that your your uh, glazing plane, your outer glazing plane, is within a couple inches of of the continuous insulation, or is is uh, if you got it, or or within your your stud insulation if it's not there, and and uh, if you've got uh, the exterior frame doesn't extend all the way out to the exterior of the building. You need to insulate that that remaining piece between inside and outside. But um, I can get a better explanation out of RDH here. So um, here is kind of like the balcony case. We're just kind of supplying some uh, maybe justification for why are we going about it this way? Why do, why do we care about the interface of windows and, and rough openings and how the insulation aligns? So here are two cases. The case on the top shows uh, the yellow insulation layer clearly aligned with the thermal break, uh, break and the uh, insulated glass unit. The, the, the thermal break in ITU, that's where uh, window systems control heat transfer, so they're typically aligned. Um, so that's good alignment there. And uh, just to the right of that uh, detail, we show the, the thermal model of that. And um, we've got a psi value. So a psi value is kind of like a U factor, except it's not per unit area. It's per um, per unit length. So this is uh, the heat transfer through that interface um, between the, uh, the the wall and the window system. So here we've got a side value of 0.013. Um, that's that's low. That's great. Um, and in the bottom case, a, a not so great example where we've got an insulation layer that is nowhere near our thermal break. Um, and model that, and uh, the uh, the side value is um, it's 1,800% higher. So not even in the same ballpark. And um, 
you know, just a note, you know, these side values, this is no, not a calculation required by code. It's just kind of to demonstrate, you know, what the code's trying to achieve. When we were in code development cycle, like RDA suggested, hey, why don't we actually take an analytical approach to like calculate how these rough openings actually perform? Um, and I think Dwayne thought that uh, folks would have a conniption if we were expecting that level of heat transfer analysis for these. So we came up with this prescriptive language to address this, which uh, I think gets us gets us most of the way there. So I think it's pretty effective. Um, so on to the next one, a couple more examples. Yeah, and I, I'd say on, on that one, just uh, you, you might want to note that, that that slab right at the edge will be cold to the touch. And if you've got carpet on there, fungus will grow in your carpet, right? Sure, condensation is possible. Well, uh, I, I got a nice picture of that. <laughs> Next slide. Okay. <laughs> of a, you know, a case similar. Um, so um, on, on the left here, uh, with our big smiley face, we've got our thermal insulation layer, which is a few inches of continuous exterior mineral wool insulation that butts tight up to this uh, curtain wall system. This is a Shuko stick-built curtain wall. Um, I don't have access to the pointer to point things out, but I think you can see the thermal insulation layer right behind the cladding there and the IGU and thermal break in plane. So uh, this is how it should be done, you know, but that thermal insulation tight to the window system, it's not gonna hurt it. We've got a really well insulated interface there um, looking great. And um, on the right here, we've got uh, the, the outside is on the right side of this detail. We've got a window system that's placed on exposed concrete. So um, our thermal control layer for that glazing system, the IGU and the thermal break below, um, there's no insulation there. So the, uh, the heat's allowed to completely bypass the thermal control and um, you know, our, basically our aluminum window wall system, aluminum's a great conductor, our aluminum curtain wall system is basically directly in contact with this very cold concrete surface. Um, so what kind of things can happen when we do this? Um, so this is an actual example from real life with this detail. Uh, we have a humidified interior space, and what do you know? Uh, there's condensation on that um, on that uh, curtain wall mullion uh, at the jam condition. Um, this is possible if we uh, do a really poor job of insulating our rough openings. You know, con condensation horrifies everybody. Um, folks hire consulture consultants to avoid it, and after this is built, it's it's pretty tough to address. Um, you can add heat trace to these mullions to warm them up, so they act like giant radiators to the outside. No one wants to do that. Um, so um, it's just um, it kind of, you know, the, this code language, the intent of it is to maybe, maybe it's going to help save us from ourselves. So we don't we don't end up in this situation right here um, by accounting for uh, you know, heat transfer at this, uh, this glazing the rough opening uh, interface. Also, um, Jason, that, that picture is from a project in Tacoma. So it's it's not like it's, you know, some super cold mountain climate. Uh, this can happen here with our relatively mild winters. And, and just to further drive the point home on the next slide, um, you know, uh, I think you can click uh, once through here, it'll it'll change it, or maybe twice. Um, dynamic slides. Um, so, um, you know, what we have here is we've got a, a window with a, um, this is kind of a, a theoretical example, kind of illustrates the importance of this. So, so we've got a six and a half inch, or six and a half foot by six and a half foot uh, square window with a U factor of 0.35. Um, but if we take into account this, uh, the, the side value at the interface of the rough opening and uh, the window system, um, and in this example, we've got a, a head compensation channel or a deflection track that's a bit of a thermal bridge and um, our continuous exterior insulation doesn't butt up tight to the window system. And so if we model that, um, we get the side value. And if we actually come up with a U factor of the combined window, plus rough opening and imagining this detail on all four sides of the six and a half foot, foot square window, the U factor actually increases from U.35 to U.47, a 33% increase. So um, ignoring these, which was kind of what we've been doing in the past, it's just not thermally accurate. So this prescriptive language to make sure these rough openings have insulation, it's properly aligned with the thermal control layer, the thermal break of the window system, um, it's gonna avoid this kind of stuff from being ignored in the code. So that's 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 what we're what we're trying to do here. Okay, um, next slide, please. And then just for, uh, just for fun, um, you know, when we're really going to the, the the nth degree here, this is kind of passive house level construction. We actually over insulate our frames. 
So it's a bit more effort to design the rough opening. So it sheds water, it's properly waterproof, everything sloped to drain. But we add typically mineral insulation to the exterior of our frames to cover those framing members to actually improve the performance of the window system. So uh, this is kind of a standard detail for passive house, this approach. Um, don't really see it uh, too often in, in construction outside of that, but uh, you know, it, it, it's totally possible to take it to the next level. Uh, just be, be sure that you can uh, you can remove and replace your IDUs if they break. Don't want to don't want to prevent that from happening in the future. So just one thing to uh, to keep in mind if you're considering over insulating your your frames. Um, so that's all I have for windows. Are we we're we gonna take a break now, Dwayne? Hey, it's a good idea. Um, so uh, we're gonna take all of three minutes, but it'll give you a chance to uh, get up and stretch your legs and say hi to all your neighbors here. And uh, we'll start again then at 1116. Okay, three minutes. Thank you very much, Dwayne. And thank you, buddy. It's been action-packed, information-packed. Uh, Weather just, just building in it for a quick reach. Uh, everyone, again, continue to engage with us. Uh, typing in in chat, we'll either be answering questions there or live. Uh, thank you. We do have one question uh, that just came in. If any of you guys uh, can, can help me out, it says, uh, hey, what about the future replacement of the frames, considering for future replacement? Oh, for the overall insulated frames um, in, in that case. Um, you know, I can pull take... that detail back up. Just go back oh. one slide. I think Dwayne's in control and he's actually taking yeah. the break. Um, you know, it's a fair point. Um, I, I, there, there definitely could be, depending on how these windows are installed, some more effort to replace those frames. Um, you know, these window systems, they're, they're long life products. So, you know, not unusual for them to last 30 plus years longer than that. Um, so um you know it's you know it's a good point that you could be creating some extra work if when it's time to replace those windows uh, the frames themselves you want to make the itus accessible to replace um but um you know i i i wouldn't expect them to have a significantly lower lifespan than the uh than the cladding systems themselves and if you have to replace some some sealant and some trim at that time um you know maybe, maybe that's a uh, not the end of the world Fair point, though. Again, that's passive house level construction. That's not a. That's nothing in the code. Jason, I, I might comment to your to your earlier point. Uh, your wondering like, well, what am I gonna do other than windows to to like, you know, as my saving throw for, for performance to, to overperform? I I might go for air tightness on that, actually. Just a suggestion. Okay, everybody. Okay. Welcome back to the show. Um, <laughs> We're gonna leave the energy code for just a minute and talk about the new wow. state restrictions on foam insulation, which are now all in effect. Um, industry's been responding by changing their blowing agents. Uh, and I think that at this point, these are all available locally, but Jason, uh, what are you using out there that meets these requirements? Sure, um, and just to note uh, kind of a critical thing uh, about these requirements is their install requirements. So, um, you know, these requirements are in effect, and it's no longer allowed to install these. Uh, the products we used to lose with the used to use with the high uh, GWP uh, blowing agent. So, here are some of the products that are available that we've seen. Demolex been making this uh, this spray foam heat lock HFO Pro for for a long time now. BASF is transitioning. Uh, Geico has a a, a closed cell spray foam one pass that uh, that also meets these uh, requirements. Uh, DuPont, uh, formerly Dow Froth Pack, we see that all the time. They said they have a press release. I couldn't get a hold of them. Um, 
they have stopped manufacturing the uh, old froth pack uh, with the old blowing agent. However, they're basically allowing that old product to be distributed for the next few years is how their press release was worded. So it still could be in circulation. So it's our job to not only specify the right products, but also during the submittal stage as designers, like make sure they're actually you, you know, submitting the correct product with the low G, uh, GWP blowing agent. But yeah, these, these, are, these are widely available. Uh, for the foam board, um, pink board of Owens Coring, they've got a, a foamular MGX that, uh, that meets these requirements. Um, so the, and we're doing this in lockstep with Canada. So same requirements apply with the, in Canada. And I found this press release from Dow, uh, or from DuPont rather, used to be Dow Blue Board, now it's DuPont. And it's no longer baby blue board, it's, um, it's gray board. Um, I think it's quite nice looking, um, an upgrade from, uh, from the blue board of the past. Um, but they, they've said they're ready to go. Um, I honestly have not seen this product on site yet. Um, maybe you have Denali, but uh, that's, um, that, that's what, um, that's what their, their press releases say anyway. So I, I think the product's available. We just got to make sure it's actually being installed. Okay. So this, this is an enacted requirement for real? Yes. Got it. This is, and, and like, uh, like Jason said, it's not based on the permit application date. It's based on the install date. So we're into it now in 2021. Um, the reason I'm including a slide about space heating uh, in this envelope seminar, having to use heat pumps, is now that there's an important exception for apartments that allows up to 750 watts per room for electric resistance or 1,000 watts in a corner room. Uh, the thought would be that it would be cheaper to upgrade the envelope a little bit than to provide a heat pump or a VRF for each apartment. Uh, Jason, what do you say? Um, yeah, so we did a couple, uh, we, we looked at a couple examples, just kind of a typical uh, apartment units from projects we've worked on and did some uh, heat capacity calculations. So here we've got a, a standard bedroom, uh, about 10 feet of exposure with a large sliding glass door. Um, and in, our, in doing our heat loss calculations, um, you know, assuming the new balanced ventilation um, requirements with heat recovery for, for our ventilation load um, and that the uh, these, uh, these enclosure elements meet prescriptive code, walls and windows. Um, you know, we're, we're calculating heat capacities of, you know, four to 500 watts approximately. So for this unit, um, that's well below 750 watts. Um, you know, it, it, with glazing areas, you know, 40% or lower, we're, we're seeing this as being, um, being very feasible. Um, and, um, you know, I did another case study on the next side with a, corner unit um, and just a word on my calculations. So kind of conventional heating capacity calculations. Um, I did not include any point source exhaust. There's a number of ways to treat that. There's actually a number of ways to route it. You know, how is it going to be routed through the HRV or how are you going to actually exhaust? So that's not included, um, you know, uh, but uh, I think that's a, that kind of is in line with convention. Some MEP engineers might have a, have a different approach. Um, so um, corner units, they may be a bit more challenging. It really just depends on how much exposure you have and, and how much glazing. So I looked at this corner unit, 35% of these walls are glazed um, with our wood framed um, requirements. We're right at 1KW. Um, and you know, I've added an extra 10% or so, uh, you know, uh, kind of safety factor in there. So we're, we're within this requirement for wood frame construction we're within that 1KW. Um, with steel frame construction and the, uh, the um, higher U values permitted for those glazing systems. Um, we're a little bit higher than that at 1200 watts, but if we, uh, if we upgrade our glazing a bit um, to uh, that U.30 that's required for the high performance glazing, that brings us down right in line with the, uh, the one kilowatt limitation on, uh, on, on heat capacity. So, um, you know, just a couple other thoughts um, running through these calculations. Um, our heating capacities, and this is kind of conventional code construction, they're getting extremely low. So we're talking about 500 watts, a kilowatt. You know, we're talking about you know um, heating systems, whether they're electric resistance or heat pumps, that are like half a ton, maybe a ton. So 6,000 to 12,000 BTUs an hour. I want to make sure our mechanical engineers are right sizing their equipment, and it also just kind of goes to show how how kind of far we've come with these uh, that we're getting our heating equipment this small. And you know, my understanding is there are you know there's DRS systems, ductless systems, and even water source heat pumps that are common in high-rise buildings that are available with these small capacities. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think it's a, 
it, it, it's just kind of it, it's impressive really how how low our capacities are getting and also you know uh, i understand the cost savings involved with going to electric resistance heat um historically there hasn't been a lot of um mechanical cooling in, in the buildings we built in seattle but it, it's becoming more common and as we're building these buildings now you know just designers take a minute to think out 20 years it's going to be a bit warmer a lot of these units are going to have southern western exposure um, as we highly insulate these buildings, um, th 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 there's a chance, and it's common with passive house as well, that we actually are at risk of overheating our units, and they're going to be uh, dreadful to live in if, if that's the case. So, you know, uh, understand the uh, the cost savings up front with the electric resistance heat. Let's also, you know, think through during the design phase, um, are, are, are we just setting ourselves up to add window units or these, you know, through wall ACs? Um, five, 10, 15 years down the line to keep these units inhabitable. Um, it's a conversation that, that we should be having. And I, I should add that that you could, I think for an apartment like this, you could go to triple glazing for an extra 1200 bucks or something like that. And it's gonna still be gonna be way cheaper than, than um, adding a heat pump for $12,000, right? Um, another big deal that's happening with apartments, and this is in the state code, so applies everywhere, um, is balanced ventilation. So uh, the days of trickle vents for your apartments are now officially over. Now you have to supply ventilation air to each habitable room with heat recovery. So this little unit in the picture can go in a wall of each apartment, but maybe you'd rather put a bigger HRV on the roof or at the end of the corridor or something. Uh, there's a few different options. What do you say? So I'm super excited about this. So we're getting heat recovery now out of our ventilation. We're not relying on trickle vents anymore in apartments, which were kind of always of questionable effectiveness at delivering fresh air. So this is this is a, an upgrade uh, for, for indoor air quality is, is really what it is, um, first and foremost. Um, so there's a few ways to configure these, uh, these uh, you know, in-suite uh, or HRVs. We can have centralized HRVs or in-suite ones. So here we're showing a, kind of a, a cartoon sketch of um, an HRV located in, in each floor. So um, what does this mean for the envelope and architecture? Um, it, it, it means a lot of penetrations. Um, and, um, you know, uh, but there, there's also advantages to having these decentralized units. It really helps us have fully compartmentalized units that are totally isolated from the adjacent units. Um, so there's an advantage there. Um, and we're also not taking up any floor area with shafts and um, you know, runs for our ducts. So these are, they're typically located in bulkheads, so the ductwork in the, these systems within each unit. Um, and uh, okay, so with all these penetrations, it's an architectural concern. I'm gonna get into kind of location of the intakes and exhaust here in a minute. Um, but we gotta keep these penetrations watertight. And uh, this is something that, you know, as an enclosure consultant, I get really amped about. Um, it's often ignored, they're like, so for example, I've got this picture, uh, this, this shop drawing here at the bottom of the page. Um, and it, it, it may be a little hard to make out. Um, so what we have is a louver that's uh, within this, uh, that's, that's, that's glazed into this unitized curtain wall system uh, directly above that uh, curtain wall stack joint. And um, so this is a small change that I got super excited about. Um, a, a curtain wall manufacturer provided a sloped mullion to put that louver within. So any water that penetrates that louver is going to go down to a slope mullion and drain out. Um, you know, it seems really minor, but like this kind of thing is really wear air. And I, I'm really glad to have it. We also have a sheet metal back pan in board of the, the louver penetration because we don't expect our louvers to remain watertight permanently. And, uh, you know, we go toe to toe with the glazing folks um, on this on this thing. So we got like a, a curtain wall system that's got great water penetration resistance. And then we poke a whole bunch of holes in it. We want our whole wall to perform to perform well long term. So it's up to us as designers to really focus on these details and, um, you know, get them right. And then also, you know, we we uh, we vet these during field testing. Um, there's a lot of discussion involved in how we go about doing that. But we want to make sure these work. And you know, same thing for wood frame construction: more penetrations, just more opportunities to mess things up. So it's kind of like blocking and tackling of construct building, you know, envelope consulting, construction design. Just got to make sure we get this uh, we get this right. Um, okay, on to the next one, please. Um, so some other concepts being tossed around. So maybe we'll have one heat recovery ventilator or, or energy recovery ventilator uh, 
heat just a heat recovery ventilator just exchange heat energy recovery ventilator exchange is the total enthalpy of the, the energy in the air heat plus moisture um, semantics both both meet the the code requirements um, and your, your mechanical engineer will probably have a, an opinion one way or the other um, uh, just uh, some thoughts on these approaches um, centralized is great for maintenance so you don't have to access these units to maintain the hrvs you know filters need to be replaced regularly etc um you can you know these are accessed either maybe in a corridor or rooftop units um so that um no tenants are interrupted it makes a lot of sense for institutional housing maybe affordable housing student housing uh this is the direction these uh those folks are going to want to go um, but, you know, something else to keep in mind is, you know, we've got rooftop units, we're eating up valuable rooftop space, we may need that for solar, more on that later, we might want that for the amenity space, we might, might want to have a spa up there, whatever the case may be. So there, there, there's trade-offs involved, there's no perfect answer here, it, it's just a discussion that you need to have. And, you know, like I mentioned before, um, you know, shaft space, if we're like eating up floor area that could be rented out, you know, that's definitely going to get developers' attention, so that's going to change how they, they do their calculations. Um, and it's uh, it's important to to have a good understanding of where these things are going. So um, you know, there's trade-offs with 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 each with each approach. And you know, it's also fire dampers. You know, often required for these centralized systems, rooftop systems. Um, you've got to have really fancy controls if you're going to deliver the right amount of fresh air to each unit. Um, that comes with a dollar sign associated with it. Um, so um, yeah, it's a uh, there's trade-offs. No silver bullets. Uh, it's a conversation on what's best for your project. Um, uh, let's go to the the next slide, please. So where can these um, intakes and openings be located? So this is out of the Washington Mechanical Code, Section 401.4. Uh, this is a plan view, um, and we've got to be 10 feet from lot lines, 10 feet from adjacent buildings. Um, all, all that language is in the code. Uh, there's uh, other requirements from streets and alleys um, that, that are written in there. So definitely take a close look at, uh, at this section of the code. Um, and uh, on to the, the next one, please. So within the building, um, we've got to be spaced. Uh, our, our intakes, our fresh air intakes and exhaust have to be spaced 10 feet horizontally. And if they're less than that, we need at least three feet of vertical spacing. So that three foot vertical spacing is the bare minimum. And uh, unless we've got a factory built intake and exhaust combination. Um, and that's really common with HRVs now. They've got these concentric terminations. You know, you blow your uh, exhaust air out one side, the intake air comes in the other. And um, they're pretty sharp and will, will, uh, work well. But you know, even with this, with HRVs, we're typically not uh, routing our dryer exhaust and our kitchen exhaust through the HRV. You know, we've got grease and lint in those. We don't want to clog our HRV with all that junk. Um, so what do we do with those exhausts? We either have to meet these spacing requirements, more penetrations, uh, and more effect on the architecture, more uh, just a uh, more difficult design, or we could think about eliminating those exhausts and really simplifying the design. So there are condensing dryers available. Um, those work great um, for um, for uh, kitchen ranges. If we've got an electric range, which is I think going to become the norm soon, um, then um, we can have a carbon filter in there. And then we also place nearby, near the kitchen, near the laundry, a, um, an exhaust that feeds into our balanced ventilation system. So we're still recirculating air through these spaces, um, but we are, um, we're not penetrating the building with uh, additional, um, additional exhaust, um, exhaust penetrations. So, um, you know, the thing with this, with the kitchen, you know, if you have someone who's cooking a lot, they may want to be able to exhaust to the outside. So it's, you know, no silver bullet, but these are, you know, definitely things that, be, can be, that should be considered. And I know the passive house folks, they really, they really like um, eliminating these, um, these penetrations whenever possible. There's, there's benefits for architecture as well. Right. We're, uh, at FIAS, we're determined to align with the new indoor air plus two requirement, which for multifamily dwelling units is going to require, uh, you know, a, a, a direct exhaust from the kitchen. Um, so yeah, we're, uh, you know, basically we're, we're, uh, in the process of figuring out like what to say about how to design the, the makeup air system for that. Um, uh, I guess another, uh, a question I had re related to this is, uh, uh, I don't, ex I don't think there's, I don't guess there's much in the code yet about what if the entire outside is full of wildfire smoke. Um, but yeah, if there's anything you could speak to there, that'd be, I'd be interested. 
hey, at least, at least, uh, you know, with the trickle vent era, there's nothing between the wildfire fire smoke and your bedroom, but at, at least with these uh, little um, heat recovery ventilator units or any of the, or the big ones either, um, there'll be a filter on the way in. It's not necessarily a great filter, but it'll pick up a bunch of that particulate on the way into the building. So you can have some fresh air. Okay, um, PTACs and PTHPs uh, are those noisy units you get in, in cheap motels that roar to life occasionally. They're extremely inefficient in our climate and, and they leak air like a sieve, but uh, they also have about the same U value as a single pane window. So now uh, in Seattle, if you wanna use uh, uh, PTACs in your, in your multifamily or your hotel building, uh, you have to count them as a U0.5, uh, another way of saying like an R2 uh, in, in your wall assembly and make up for it elsewhere. Or better idea, just use some better technology. Uh, these, are, these are notoriously leaky of heat and air. Um, here's how that PTAC business integrates into the U value table. It's footnote K that we've added in there. So, uh, Seattle now requires a quarter of a watt of PV on your roof for every square foot of floor area in the buildings, instead of our uh, earlier requirement for about a third of that. And, and now the state has adopted an optional appendix that jurisdictions could adopt with that smaller value, that uh, earlier value that Seattle had. But uh, that only has any weight if any jurisdictions do adopt it, I'm not sure. Uh, in addition, Seattle and the state both require 40% of the net roof area to be prepped for some future solar, which means little heavier roof load and a few capped sleeves through the roof. Uh, if you're curious about how big this array is, a two-story building would need about three and a half percent of the roof area. That includes the walking space between the uh, PV. Uh, and a 20-story building would need 36%. So note that the projects that don't want the solar on the roof because they're doing something else or they don't have room for it have a few alternatives to choose from but jason how are they going to build that roof with that's going to be the future pv sure um you know yeah just a quick word on how this affects uh the building enclosure um two primary ways two ways solar systems are mounted ballasted systems so basically the weight of the system keeps it anchored on the roof um, and attached systems that are mechanically fixed to the roof. Um, NRCA, the National and Roofing Contractors Association, they prefer attached systems. And, and, and their reasoning is um, that with the ballasted systems and a seismic event, or if there's a ton of wind, maybe they're gonna shift. And in shifting, they might, they could damage the roof. I think that's their primary justification. You know, but, but really both systems can work. We just need to think through it logically. Um, you know, with a ballasted system, um, you know, here's a picture of one on the right there, the ballasted system from a project I worked on. One of the negatives with this system is there's no access to the roof membrane underneath it. So if there's a repair to make, we actually have to remove PV panels to make that repair. If there's maintenance to do, um, like a single ply roof like this, you have a cut edge sealant, um, difficult access for that. So, um, you know, that's something to keep in mind, um, you know, avoiding seams where the PV panels are located, ideally, although maybe that's not realistic. Um, and um, something very important to consider is, um, the, you know, how, what, what about like the, the lifespan of the roof compared to the lifespan of the solar PV system? So if you're not installing a solar PV system now, but you want to be ready to do so in the future, you know, you really got to think of, well, if this... PV system has a 25 year life and my roofing is, a, I've got a 20 year roof on there, but I'm 10 or 15 years into the lifespan of that roof before it needs to be replaced. You know, maybe that's not an ideal time to install a solar PV system, or maybe the solar PV system needs to be installed away mechanically attached to stanchions perhaps, where um, re-roofing can happen without affecting the solar PV install. So those are, um, you know, those are some basic considerations. The code has, section C411, the code has um, requirements for the structure to be able to accept the future um, load of the PV system. So that's written in there. Something we have to consider is the load of these ballasted systems, they weigh more. So, um, and um, also a oh, cover board, uh, the, 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 the board that goes directly under your roof membrane, you know, put a solid cover board in there, Densdeck Prime or similar, 
Um, and um, especially if you're doing a ballasted system, consider upgrading your uh, roof insulation compressive strength mm -hmm. so that it's um, it's suitable for uh, to accept the weight of that ballasted PV system. On the okay. R406 is our additional efficiency options table, and it's been reorganized so that each building type gets a different number of points for each credit, and you've got to get eight points total in Seattle or six points in the rest of the state. <clears throat> a friendly local engineer marked up what he thinks are the slam dunk uh, options in green <clears throat> and the second best ones in red. You can see that he sees the envelope insulation and air barrier tightness in that second category. We do see people going for the air barrier tightness uh, option sometimes, but rarely for the insulation one. So I'm not sure I'd agree that uh, it's that economical, but you might want to uh, go ahead and take a look sometime. Remember that I mentioned that we have a whole new modeling method now. And the way it works is that you calculate how much carbon emissions your building would have produced under this very old version of ASHRAE 90.1 and then show that your building will only produce a particular percentage of those emissions. So for an office tower, your building would only be allowed 54% as much emissions in the state code or 49% as much emissions in Seattle. Seattle's are lower to adjust for all those prescriptive differences between the state and city codes we've been talking about for the last little while. Um, thus far, uh, Energy modeling for code compliance has been used almost exclusively to permit buildings to have worse envelopes. So a big deal in this code here is that the building envelope is only allowed to be made 20% worse than prescriptive in the state and only 10% worse in Seattle. I, I was saying zero tolerance, but I got kind of talked back off the ledge there. Uh, remember that one of the first slides I showed you said that maintaining a quality envelope is paramount to get to our 2050 goals. So you could still have big windows, but uh, it, in that case, I'm starting to see some triple glazing in your future. To finish up my part here, I wanted to spend a few minutes on existing buildings. So if you're doing an addition, you can have just the addition comply with the uh, code, or you can have the whole building existing plus addition comply. This might come in handy if you want a really glassy addition to a building that's pretty opaque, for instance. And anything uh, bigger than 500 square feet does need to get those C406 credits I just mentioned. For alterations, the basic rules are that existing stuff can remain in place pretty much forever if it was legal to begin with. But if you put in a new window or rebuild your roof, the new thing has to meet code. If it really isn't going to work in your existing building, come in and talk with us. But as a hint, don't just come in and say, you don't wanna do this because it's a, a pain or it costs a fortune. Come in armed with some kind of proposal to do something else better on your business than uh, on your building that balances out the energy loss for the thing that you, you, you can't do. And, and we'll be a, a lot less grumpy about it. Uh, alterations have a list of exceptions. Like if you open up a stud wall, you only have to fill it with insulation. You don't have to bring the insulation all the way up to current code. But look at this picture. Do you think this qualifies as a roof recover? Remember my advice from an hour ago? Uh, check those definitions because this looks to me like they're tearing off the old roof and replacing it with new roofing, which would mean it's a roof replacement and it doesn't qualify for this exception. Uh, you all love the concept of substantial alterations, right? That's usually when we've determined that a project like a whole gut and remodel is so big that it substantially extends the physical or economic life of the building. So another trigger would be a building that's been vacant for several years. Either way, at, at that point, we're pretty much treating it like a new building. I'm mentioning this here in this seminar because one of the compliance paths is that you can have the building envelope be 15% worse than code if everything else inside is fully code compliant. Another option is that you could use the energy modeling and have the whole building be 10% worse than, clothes, than code. Now, um, we have exceptions for buildings that are just st stabilizing an unreinforced masonry shell, and for landmark buildings, and for newer buildings that have been empty for a couple of years, like happens during recessions. Uh, and these rules also apply if you're converting a factory or a warehouse into 
a boutique restaurant mall or something like that. Uh, wrapping up here, I want to emphasize that the building envelopes we create this decade will outlive us all. So we've got to make them things that we want to proudly pass down to future generations. But to make sure that I don't have the last word about this, RDH is going to take us home with their view of the future. Okay, thanks, Dwayne. We'll uh, we'll run through this quickly. I don't know if we want to open it up for uh, save some time for questions at the end. So I'll I'll try to I'll make it make it snappy. Um, so you know, um, there's real lim limitations on the thermal performance of the unitized glazing systems that we use commonly today. So curtain wall, window wall, and those are primarily related to the spandrel insulation. So in the current code, we haven't addressed this in a, in a concrete way. We add continuous insulation to the interior of those spandrels um, to increase their R value. But in reality, as Dwayne discussed earlier, that doesn't it doesn't really work because we have uh, we have aluminum mullions that extend from the interior of the building to the exterior, so that insulation isn't very effective. In fact, we find we studied it. We find that it, it really, if you're actually physically assessing it accurately, um, th those spandrel assemblies top out at like R9, R10, even if you're adding a bunch of continuous interior insulation. It's not the way the code treats it, but it's it's reality. So we're looking at different approaches. Um, and um, so here we've got something, a uh, curtain wood um, that's kind of in development um, where we've got a CLT panel that's uh, formed. This is, looks just like a curtain wall stack joint. We've got a boatload of exterior continuous mineral insulation, um, waterproofing membrane applied to the CLT and, and, you know, um, and we clad it all. We have cladding attachments and you know, clad it all. Um, so this is something we're working uh, through on a, a high rise passive house project that's in development in, uh, in, in British Columbia. Um, and you know, you, right here we're showing a CLT, but you could replace this um, with a, a, a steel frame structure with exterior insulation. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really not limited to CLT. And uh, I think there's a kind of a lively debate if CLT is actually uh, suitable here. So let, let's go to the next slide, please. So there's some animation that we can click through here. What, what, one of the things that's appealing about CLT is we can get big panels, like 50 feet wide. And so less panels means less joints. So uh, if we've got large panels, these things can be constructed really fast. And what Dwayne's kind of going through here is we're showing that with the, the bottom of the stack joint, here's the top of the stack joint, the so-called chicken head uh, with some flashing applied. So this is intended to snap together a lot like a unitized curtain wall would. We've got small punched openings um, to make this you know, very thermally efficient, high quality, small windows, um, exterior mineral insulation, and um, yeah, just uh, keep clicking through here. Um, and uh, there we have our peachy uh, strapping that's uh, attached uh, over the insulation for our cladding attachment points. Um, cladding sticks to that. And there we have, it's a module. And then, oh, we just plop them on the building, seal the joints, um, and um, you just keep clicking through, Dwayne, and we'll, uh, we'll just run right through it. And uh, we're good to go. And we treat this like kind of like curtain wall. We do performance mock-up testing. We want to make sure this works. These are expensive endeavors, you know, newer approaches to construction where we've got a sealant at a stack joint, a silicone sheet, sealant applied to the panel joints. Um, you know, just again, the larger we can make the panels, the less field applied sealant, um, the more factory control and the quicker these things can go up. So we're really seeing a, an opportunity there to de decrease construction time and um, also improve thermal performance and, 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 and we're doing our best to keep the cost down. We're very focused on that similar anchor system that you would have to a, to a unitized current wall system, but uh, you know, more weight. Um, so here's another project, high rise project uh, uh, planned in, Van in Vancouver. Um, target high glazing ratios, uh, needs to look nice, architecturally significant building, uh, balconies, um, targeting 50% window wall, uh, didn't quite get there. So how do we go about, how are we going about doing this? This project's uh, progressing through design. Um, I think it's out to bid. Uh, so let's keep going uh, through the slides here. So rather than a uh, CLT backup wall, here we've got a steel frame backup wall, window bucks installed to receive our, our, our windows. These are large fixed windows, uh, curtain wall. Um, everything's insulated from the exterior with mineral wool. We're not insulating from the interior. That exterior mineral wool is much more effective. We're gonna get the actual R value out of that insulation. Um, the, those vertical pieces are clad with um, uh, opaque uh, glazing, spandrel glazing, so we get the look of, uh, you know, uh, of a standard curtain wall. There's our horizontal insulation. Uh, that gets clad with a curved metal panel. And um, 
there we see uh, this is a rendering and we're, uh, we're, we're I think we're, we're, we're pretty darn close to the architectural intent here. The spandrel pandrels are a bit proud of the um, of, of the uh, vision glazing um, to get the insulation adequate amount, adequate amount of insulation, but we're uh, I think everyone's feeling pretty good about how this is designed. So this is what we get really excited about. This is what we see as being next. It's kind of on the bleeding edge of, uh, of construction practice and, and, and a way to um, perhaps upgrade. This is upgrading our, our standard curtain wall seduction. We're increasing the effective R value three, four times with, with a, a change in approach like that. So we're looking for industry to step up um, and uh, come with come with solutions similar to this that, that we can use in the future. Um, to have to build a uh, build great thermal envelopes that meet uh, passive house standards. Okay, cool. Um, let's uh, hand it back to Mr. Armando to finish up. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and emphasizing how how we covered content about the past, the present, and even uh, the future. It's a uh, a lot of uh, information. Uh, very glad we were able to to have all that time. Any additional questions please feel free to put them in in chat right now uh i'm going to be turning it over to uh julie banerjee with a customer care and energy solutions division in seattle city light uh we're going to be i'm going to be pulling up a couple of polls where we want to just get your temperature and a couple of questions and as, as you have questions be it for our subject matter expert presenters or our program implementer julie please type them in the chat and we'll be discussing them but for now i'm going to be pulling up a couple of polls. Julie, if you just want to walk us through the, the, the questions. Yeah. Uh, and so my name is Julie and I'm involved in managing our new construction incentive programs at Seattle City Light. And we're hoping today to just learn a little bit more about you and your goals and your new construction projects in the coming years, particularly under this code. So we're gonna start with this one. What path or strategy do you believe you'll use more often for your code compliance? We have prescriptive path, total building performance path, or the target building performance path. All right, thank you everybody for voting. I'm gonna keep it up for about five more seconds as, as, as the response is still trickling in. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close it and share. We see a prescriptive path being a solid popular uh, answer and uh, the breakdown here. So, so I appreciate you guys for participating with us. Uh, Julie, will, will this uh, help, help uh, impact how, how you guys look at programs going going forward. Definitely. Uh, at, we're still waiting for the 2018 Seattle Energy Code to be finalized, as Dwayne mentioned earlier. And we're trying to understand the best way for us to provide incentives for you to exceed uh, code and achieve your energy efficiency goals. So understanding what pathway you decide to go really helps us. Beautiful. I'm going to launch this next poll. And with that, how likely will your future projects be above code minimum efficiency? One of our roles is really to help you achieve your energy goals that are above code. And as we're getting more stringent codes, we're looking at new ways of supporting you all in achieving those, whether it's events like this or with monetary incentives. All right, thank you for that. And uh, I see the response is trickling in about three, five more seconds. All right, I'm going to close this one and uh, happy happy to share. It's a it's a good bell curve. <laughs> Definitely, I know there's a lot to decide, so somewhat likely makes a lot of sense. All right, <laughs> two two more polls, and and if anyone wants to continue engaging with us, please uh, type in questions in chat. But I'm going to go ahead and. The third out of four polls here. Right. So today was a big step in learning about the new code, but what are the considerations that are really most important to you, to your projects, uh, when you're thinking about going above that minimum code efficiency requirements? And our options are upfront cost, customer interest, supply chain availability project timeline, technical knowledge, and I believe you can select more than one. 
So, that is correct. Great. And five more seconds. Seeing some clear popular choices here. And we're gonna be sharing. Great, so it looks like we have upfront costs as the largest, but then technical knowledge and customer interest as well. And so this is really helpful because CityLate actually can um, provide incentives at various levels. So it could be working with um, people who are doing the projects so on a project basis, or sometimes we also work with distributors or contractors uh, to make sure that products are available uh, at a more reasonable cost or even just stocked for you all to access. Awesome, and this is gonna be our last uh, poll here. Uh, and Julie, if you can explain the question a little bit, I ran out of space to type it completely, but I believe this is for okay. the uh, building performance path. Uh, actually, this is for the prescriptive. So what uh, Dwayne had just kind of gone over, we're interested in if you're actually considering using the either the uh, envelope performance or the air infiltration credits. Um, the, we were looking at those kind of green ones that you know a lot of people were thinking about, and these are a little bit lower uh, as what people might choose as a credit in the prescriptive path. And this is really helpful for us and uh, to understand where we can continue supporting people uh, in their code journey, uh, whether it's them picking up one of these uh, options or one of the other um, points that are possible. Awesome, thank you very much. I'm gonna be closing in three seconds. Closing, sharing, Just a little bit of everything, very nice. <clears throat> yeah, and so it'll be interesting to see and, and to talk with you all as you're looking at your new construction projects, uh, what you end up proposing, what up, ends up being accepted and how City Light can help you achieve your energy efficiency goals. So. All right, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I see a, I'm gonna shout you out, Greg Bishop, thank you uh, very much. We have an incorrect date up here. Uh, the next uh, cost-effective code compliance uh, delivery on lighting, it's going to be February 2nd and not January 2nd, how, how we have it here. So next week, February 2nd is gonna be uh, code compliance on lighting. And uh, we are here nearing our, our end of the presentation. Uh, looking to see if there's any any questions and uh do have one question i think we can get to uh jason it was on your last uh section uh why would you do a prefab clt wall panel when you could do a frtw wood frame variation for much less it calls out better thermal efficiency a la crease proprietary system um Okay, FRTW, fire resistance treated wood. Um, I'm not familiar with uh, Cree's uh, proprietary system. I would say at this point, all options are on the table and we're trying to figure out what's gonna be most cost effective so that this actually gets built. I think we're really, um, we're, we're concerned with, uh, with, with driving down costs. And if you've got another option on the table that can work, um, fire resistance requirements are uh, very focused to uh, are very important to focus on. Um, make sure we're meeting those code requirements as we uh, as we change construction practices. Um, what I think the the kind of key principles are are modular pan and panelized. So something that we can we can build largely on the ground, factory quality control, lift large panels into place, and watch the tower go up real fast. Um, I think that's what's really going to enable a change to higher performance enclosures for these high-rise buildings um, and um, uh, you know um, if you've got a better idea bring it forward by all means and we'll see a we'll see a which which winners shake out you know but awesome. do do check the building code because there are limitations based on the height of the building on on whether you can use uh, even a fire retreat treated stick frame system like that so just Make sure you don't do something that's going to be a disaster. I think part of it's also just that CLT is cool, and a lot of people really like CLT, and uh, and it looks cool as like an interior finish. So there's like there's something to be said for that. It's not 
all entirely based on performance. Um, there okay. are some things that are just appealing. One more thing, uh, as you get to certain heights uh, of building with with uh, CLT, it, the CLT has to be covered with uh, with chipboard or some other kind of a, a thermal barrier. So uh, <clears throat> once again, check and make sure that you can do your dream like that <clears throat> before you start depending on being able to see it. Or else we can make you like a fake field CLT like wallpaper that you could put on the inside of the chip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a final wallpaper. <laughs> oh God. Uh, yeah, we've done it with, uh, with, with with CLT, or we've got this one in design with CLT. We've done mid-rise with CLT in the past as well at a project in Spokane, um, and uh, steel frames combined with HSS backup wall as opposed to CLT. I, I'm not aware of a wood framed uh, one that's with, that's been built though. With the same concept. Uh, well. We may have time for one quick last question. I see. Will the code ever just eliminate all costs and move to EUI based requirements? Um. <laughs> oh. Well, that's the way <clears throat> that's the way the code in in Denmark and another number of other European countries works. Is that it's just EUI in in Canada? They're moving towards EUI plus carbon emissions plus uh, uh, thermal uh, thermal losses from the building as as three metrics, but um, we're still we're still quite a ways out I think from from having a fully uh, performance based code. All right. Well, thank you very much to all our uh, panelists, subject matter experts, uh, the participant Julie Banerjee and myself. We want to say thank you very much for joining us today, uh, and see you next week. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks for having us here. Bye.